Josh Owen is a really exciting guy. I think you're going to find him fascinating. We talked and talked and talked after I picked him up at the airport. Really interesting guy. Um, he graduated from Cornell University in 1994 with a BFA in sculpture and a BA in visual studies. In 1997, he received an MFA in furniture design from the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, Josh is currently an associate professor of industrial design at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And he previously taught at Philadelphia University where he held the Greg, Craig R. Binson Chair for Innovation. He also teaches a product design course at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. He's founder of, the jo of Josh Owen LLC. His professional projects are produced by major international manufacturers including Areaware, Casamania, Kickerland, and Umbra. He has been the winner of three Chicago Athen Athenium Good Design Awards, the International Design Award, and has received uh, honorable mentions for the ID Annual Design Review and the Red Dot Design Award. Josh is the author of the book Big Ideas, Small Packages, and his work is included in the permanent design collections of the Centre Georges Pompidou, the Denver Art Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Chicago uh, Athenaeum, and the Musée des Beaux-Arts in uh, de Montreal. His work has been featured in major exhibitions, numerous books on design, and is regularly included in critical design discourse. Wow, pretty impressive. Welcome, Josh Owens. I think so. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Andy, and um, thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. It's, it's always fun to uh, step out of your comfort zone and visit other uh, schools and cities. I'm, I'm just a little bit sad that I don't have more time to be here and, uh, and to get into your studios and, and see what you're all up to. Uh, does this sound okay to everyone? Yeah? Okay. Um, although I, Andy did give me a, a quick uh, tour um, through the studios and I had a chance to see what some of the freshmen are up to and to see some of the output uh, across the areas. And it looks like you're, um, you guys are having a good time. Are you having a good time? Yeah. Good. All right. Well, let's get to it then. Um, let's see if we can turn this on. All right, here we go. Um, so I think I have to show you this slide. This is important. And this slide, which is also important. Um, but I put it in my typeface, the one that I use for everything, so it's a little bit cleaner looking. Um, so uh, I was asked uh, what the title of the lecture is, Lens is Design, what does it mean? We're going to find out. Um, my, my work uh, as a professional, and that's what I'm here to talk about primarily today, um, is, uh, is very much focused on um, working uh, between professional activities and um, academic activities. And uh, in order to, to find ways to create synergies, um, I've, I've tried lots of things. And um, finding simple, is the hardest uh, part of working, I think, between academics and practice. And so this is uh, kind of the subtitle for the lecture. Um, I think in today's uh, day and age, uh, it's quite important to um, play for keeps. As a product designer, um, as an educator, as one who brings things into the world, um, it's important that the things that we bring um, both embody meaning um, and um, have embedded in their reality a reason to be uh, that extends their life. Um, heirloom products are a way of thinking about um, making these objects of meaning or making contributions that don't um, find their way to the landfill. Um, and I think this, this idea of finding simple uh, is a way of, of, of streamlining or, or thinking about making products which, um, which address a need um, that, that has an urgency that can go on 
beyond um, their immediate um, discourse. Um, we're, we're surrounded by what I like to call encoded objects, objects that um, are full of stories, are full of meaning, are full of uh, material and technological um, aspects. And our job, our jobs as designers, um, are not just to encode objects, but also to decode them and to understand what the, what the systems and the thinking um, that realize these objects are and how we can use those systems and those uh, ways of thinking to, to bring better objects into the world. Um, just to give you an idea of my background, um, how did I come to design? And you heard my credentials are not tr uh, traditional industrial design background. Um, I studied uh, at Cornell um, something like anthropology and visual studies uh, and sculpture. And the reason I think I, I moved into those areas um, out of high school is because I grew up um, with an archaeologist father. I spent most of my summers going with him on these excavations, mostly in the Middle East. Um, and uh, I loved it. It wasn't uh, the Indiana Jones image that you might be conjuring. Uh, there were no bull whips and cool coats and uh, you know, giant balls chasing you through a cave. Um, it was a slow, methodical process, a grueling process of peeling away layers of earth in the search for stories, for understanding stories, understanding cultures, understanding um, what materials and technologies um, were used to develop artifacts for daily life. And I, I found it fascinating. Even as a seven-year-old kid, I was, uh, I was there at four in the morning uh, with, a, with a pickaxe, as, as best as I could manage, um, pulling away these layers of earth and, and, and sort of chasing the mystery, chasing the, the unfolding puzzle. So I think that uh, it's somewhat obvious that um, those kinds of influences um, really drove me towards, uh, towards understanding materials, technologies, objects, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I wonder if we can get, can we get the lights down a little bit, or I don't know if that's possible. It seems like these might be a little blown out, image-wise. Um, some examples um, of things that, that I collect as I um, kind of move about. I think Many of us as designers are collectors. We're, we're intrigued by objects, sometimes cars or uh, sneakers, right? The list goes on and on. Um, for me, uh, you know, and Andy and I were talking a lot about this earlier, it, the, the world is just full of interesting um, things, and, and it's our job to, uh, to understand them. So uh, on the left is a, um, is a, a felt uh, slipper. It's a shoe, really, from Siberia. And uh, what I think is fascinating about that object is there's really no design there. This is a kind of perfect synergy of materials and technology and, and human need in this little vehicle. It's just shaped around a foot, kind of a universal uh, shape that you can get in and out of. The only discernible detail is a tab that enables you to, uh, to easily slip it on and off. And, and felted wool is a you know, renewable resource. Uh, it, it's, it wicks moisture away from the body. It's buoyant on, uh, on heavy snows. So there's everything about this design is perfect for its environment. And for me, that's where the beauty um, comes from, in, in that kind of harmony with its environment and its material use and so on. On the right is, uh, is something I found uh, hiking in the Peruvian Andes. Um, there, uh, they make their sandals from old tires uh, that, that emerge all over the place there. And uh, it's hard work to make those sandals. Uh, if you've ever tried taking a, a not so terrific knife and hacking through a steel belted radial tire, uh, it's, it's a bit of work. Um, but they, they're incredibly robust and they last a really long time. Um, again, no design in there, but um, using efficiencies um, from the world around them. Uh, and another example of, uh, of this kind of icon of a, of a bag, uh, which, you know, for hundreds of years, maybe more, were made in this, in this method um, from leather. So 
For me, uh, design uh, is a lifestyle. It's, it's a way of seeing the world. It's a way of behaving. It's a way of interacting. It, it's, a, it's a holistic practice that borders on religion, I suppose. Um, and so we, as designers, we, we, we construct our lives around these principles. Um, I like this slide because it, it shows my priorities. Um, and academics and practice exist on the same plane as I suggested earlier. And that creates certain opportunities and certain synergies that I'll get to. Um, this is a, I, sh I need to update this for my new life in Rochester. I was in Philadelphia for, uh, for more than 13 years um, teaching at Philadelphia University and, and operating my studio. Uh, and I used to live in an old cigar factory. I now live uh, in a house in the woods along the Erie Canal. Um, but I, I still um, create these efficiencies by having the, the studio attached to the house. Uh, the university is close by, it, you'll find in life that things become complicated and your job is to figure out how to do all the things you want to do. So as a designer, um, that's, that's, uh, that's our bread and butter. So um, I'm in Rochester now and uh, I like this slide because it locates me. The Pittsford Village is where it is because of the Erie Canal. It was the first settlement in 1789. Um, in the Rochester area. The, the city of Rochester came later. Um, but as you can see, it's on a major trade route there um, with the Erie Canal being that white line that passes through the Pittsford Village. Um, this is a, a shot of my studio that um, you know, was on some blog site a while back. Somebody told me they saw it. And um, uh, the funny thing was, you know, on these like Design Boom or Design Milk or whatever site it was, they put in these comments, like they allow you to comment. And so everybody wants to comment. They're not all brilliant comments. And somebody said, it's too clean to be a design studio. I never really lower myself to jump into these conversations because it's a, it's a black hole. But I would have jumped in and said, we photographed it the day after we finished it. <laughs> so it really is not so clean anymore. Um, in any case, uh, so the studio is small, um, but it's, it's, a, um, it's sort of the right environment. Um, for uh, the work that I do, and it, it has just what I need. One of the advantages of, of kind of uh, moving uh, your life is to reevaluate how you work. And so after 13 years of working in an old cigar factory, this new, uh, this new setup allowed me to kind of design and build um, just the right um, studio for me. So um, I like to say Rochester is strategically dislocated. <laughs> um, you know, I. Rochester has a, a mixed rap, maybe like Detroit does, um, and, uh, and there are things which are both um, easy and hard about being in a place which is not New York City. Um, but, uh, but this map kind of uh, shows that strategic dislocation. We're very close to um, some wonderful natural areas, and we're not so far off uh, from urban areas either. I mean, I, I regularly uh, I'm in New York City to shake a hand and come back and tuck my kids into bed afterwards um, because it is a one-hour flight. Um, the, the landmark organizations in Rochester um, consist of Eastman Kodak that you probably know about, um, Frontier, Xerox, Bausch and Lomb, uh, and we're just down the street from Corning, which is a really interesting player, uh, among others. So this gives Rochester a very unique kind of aspect. We have kind of a white collar um, industry presence that, that goes back to its founding. Um, and then we've got a huge um, uh, educational um, presence with the University of Rochester and uh, their medical center, which is one of the best in the country, and also um, RIT. So maybe a bit like you, um, for me, the competitive advantage of RIT is that it is a we have a design school, a robust design school within a university setting. Um, you know, this is not going to be, the lecture today is not about uh, RIT, but just to give you some context for my work there, RIT is a large school. We have 18,000 students, um, and the campus is, uh, is situated there along the Genesee River. Um, the brewery is just at the end, Andy. Um, and, uh, and we are uh, the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences at the heart of the campus. And the College of Imaging Arts and Sciences has um, a number of schools, one of which is the school design. And all these sort of uh, fingers that we reach to are the different um, aspects of the university which we make um, good use of. A few of them are uh, the Center for Student Innovation, 
um, which uh, is a kind of uh, incubator for student projects that come from engineering, come from design business, uh, the health sciences, and you, know, you regularly walk through there and see all kinds of interesting collaborations going on. Um, one of which I, I was just talking about earlier, one of our students I found out the night before last won a uh, $100,000 at the um, of pocket money, I'm told, um, at the, uh, the mass, um, uh, the mass, uh, what is it called, mass challenge? Something like that in, in Boston for a project which was incubated here in the Innovation Center. This was a pretty big deal for him and, and the funny thing of the story with, uh, with Sean, who's in one of my classes right now, um, is I, I, I saw him today to congratulate him on his $100,000 winning for his project. And uh, I said, I have to leave class a few minutes early, otherwise I'd talk to you about it more. Uh, and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Lawrence Tech. And he said, I almost went to Lawrence Tech. It's a really great school. So there's a plug for you guys. The $100,000 man likes you. Um, I should run it up the flagpole here, yeah. Um, the other thing that we have going for us, which is new, is the Vignelli Center for Design Studies, which was just um, put in place two years ago as I walked in the door there. Um, the Vignelli Center uh, is an archive of Massimo and Lela Vignelli's life's work, uh, and they're among probably the most notable uh, graphic, architect, industrial design people um, that are still working. And, uh, you, you might know their work from the subway map, the New York City subway map that they did, but many other sort of ubiquitous products as well. Um, and what we have is every cocktail napkin sketch, every model that they ever made. It's really a, an amazing collection, which we use as teaching tools. Uh, and the other piece that um, I was talking about earlier uh, is the Galasano Institute for Sustainability. This is a rendering, but the building's almost done now. Um, and so we, we've just uh, minted an architecture program which is not built within the design framework but within a sustainability framework which will be, uh, create some interesting opportunities for us. The industrial design program, uh, the undergraduate was ranked number two, uh, sorry, number three and the graduate program number two in design intelligence last year. So we feel we're doing something right. So, um, it, it, with regard to my practice, I, I think of my work um, uh, in, in three um, kind of uh, models. Uh, one is uh, working by experiment, uh, the second by client, and the third is an academic track. And this is where the mixing happens. Um, and you can see by looking at these sort of trajectories that, uh, that many um, kind of have similar um, touchstone points along the way. So there's a lot of potential for, for overlap. Um, conceptual framework for this lecture uh, is, is built on um, a talk that I've been uh, doing for some time now um, that looks at uh, kind of theory and process. And the theory part, um, I'm going to take you through some lenses for design, as I call them, which uh, will look at experiments and client-driven work. And then with regard to process, we'll talk about um, two case studies, um, and then uh, we'll pull it together at the end. So um, for these experiments, um, these, are, these are, have become teaching tools for me, um, looking at, at product design through these different lenses. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about um, a number of them. So anachronistic adaptation. I, I think you all know that what we're looking at on the left here is probably a smartphone, maybe an iPhone, right? On the right uh, is a drawing of a cuneiform tablet, which is really our first organized writing system. And I show you this uh, because I think it's important uh, that we're reminded as designers that, um, that we're, st we're always um, held accountable to the human condition. And while things change dramatically and we have a habit of, um, of uh, getting ahead of ourselves with technology, there's still things that are very much uh, important to consider like the touch and feel of something. Um, the radius of an edge and what our limitations are in terms of uh, uh, what we can see and what we can process. So this project um, was uh, for a company called Areaware, which is a Manhattan-based uh, boutique design company, and it's a, it's a menorah. Um, and I, I, I picked this because I think it's, a, you know, it's such a common typology. Uh, and to do this project, to, to sort of reinvent something which uh, is so ubiquitous and has been iterated probably millions of times as a product um, is a real challenge. 
But for me to, to try to unthink what we've thought, to look for the habits that lead us to um, kind of sincere innovation uh, is the challenge and the interesting part. So in the end, um, many people put menorahs on, um, on plates to catch the wax drippings. And so the principal innovation here is that uh, this is a plate combined with a candelabra. Uh, but it's also thinking through the, the materiality. It's cast iron. Um, it's got a, a substantial weight to it and, and, a, and a good feel. And it, um, you know, it, it insulates there when you, when you put the match on it and so on and so forth. And this has been um, a strong seller and uh, actually just was accessioned into the National uh, Jewish Museum in Philadelphia's collection. Another example of anachronistic adaptation, looking at these wonderful sub-Saharan African chairs, which are kind of um, sliced from um, concentric uh, pieces of uh, a tree and slotted together to form the structure. This was a project that was done for a Canadian manufacturer called Umbra, which uh, never worked out. So in other words, we went back and forth. Umbra made prototypes uh, in Canada, and US, uh, China, and Italy. And in the end, we, we simply couldn't bring it in for the right price point. Um, but, uh, but it lives for me in this kind of realm of experiment. Um, and, um, and I think a, an interesting um, kind of uh, upgrade to an archetypical idea. Repurposing. Um, you know, I, I, I've lived through the period of um, uh, dematerialization of music, and uh, the jewel case was this step along the way. Um, and, and witnessing people's changing uh, value associated um, with uh, how music is captured uh, was, was quite interesting. And, and when this thing started to find its way to the landfill, I kind of puzzled over it and ended up making this, um, this piece, which has won a bunch of awards and been in different kind of exhibits about repurposing and so on. I never really thought about this as a, as a useful product design, but it was a kind of experiment. And um, again, that's, that's one of those trajectories that I, I like to work in, because I think it's quite important uh, to, to, um, to follow that kind of thought in order to, uh, to disseminate ideas. Um, Temporal graffiti, um, this notion that uh, we leave behind imprints or marks and it's a kind of uh, a thing that, that we do as human beings um, led to uh, a bunch of research around thermochromatic liquid crystals. And this was done in the, uh, I guess, the mid-1990s before we had ironed out the kinks in this uh, particular material. But uh, I had done a big project for a bar in Philadelphia. There I have a little, little bit more hair. Um, and that, that bar was a, a collaboration with a company based in California that was able to engineer this material, this uh, heat-based reaction um, color-changing material to, uh, to form a, a seamless um, surface on this bar top. And it was actually a, a really uh, great piece for the duration that it was there before the bar turned uh, to different ownership and then uh, they tore the bar out. This piece was another kind of experiment with a uh, particular material, which was a, a new development in, um, in fiber optic technology, enabled fiber optics to be flexible and offer a high degree of side lighting. And so this was experimenting with that material in a, in a kind of product design way. But outside, again, outside the realm of a consumer product, thinking about how you could use light to inform your environment uh, and in a malleable way. This is now in the um, Denver Art Museum's permanent design collection. Um, another uh, interesting kind of offshoot, uh, this project was part of a constellation of um, products designed for Kickerland, where we were, um, <coughs> excuse me, where we were looking at the, uh, the kitchen and um, and tools for use in the kitchen. Uh, the idea that a, um, a, a device for slicing cheese could also be um, for cutting cheese um, seemed like a, a, a very interesting idea, and we pursued that um, to develop these, these prototypes, and in the end, there was no market for it in the US. The, the owner of Kickerland happens to be a Dutchman, and uh, so at the time, they weren't distributing in Europe, and this, this would have been a, a good one for the, the Dutch market. 
but not for the U.S. So these are some ideas, uh, or it gives you some context for some of the experiments. And now we're going to move to some um, client-based work that shows you how um, it might behave differently um, when working for a, uh, a manufacturer. So cause and effect, kind of um, very interesting um, idea of, uh, of interface. Um, you know, th this is a, a close-up of a guitar amp, but um, we're, we're now kind of uh, falling away from the framework of haptic or tactical uh, um, uh, kind of interface with products in this way. We, we now think of digital interface much more readily. And um, at the time, uh, this is uh, also the mid-90s, I was thinking about how that, that interface um, could generate um, ideas. And um, this led to the development of a lamp, which was the first thing that I ever had in production with Umbra um, over in Toronto. And these are some of the studies. The end piece was this uh, lamp that um, becomes brighter or dimmer on rotation. And we were still pretty much slave to the incandescent bulb when this thing um, went live. So while I was thinking about here using compact fluorescent, dimmable compact fluorescent, Dimmable compact fluorescent technology was, you know, very, very expensive, although emergent at that time. So there was some play with trying to do that, but uh, it didn't work out, and LEDs were really a pipe dream back then. So it had to be incandescent. It took a lot of work to get this um, to, to do what it needed to do with proper heat flow patterns and so on. Um, but in the end, uh, it was a good product for them, and it did well for a couple of years. Proximal relationships, um, thinking about how um, our, our habits and our environments kind of coalesce to create opportunities. Um, this was, uh, again, in that constellation of products for Kickerland's Kitchen. Um, uh, this was a, a bottle opener which has a space for a lighter in it, so thinking about those things that happen in the, uh, in the kitchen. And then uh, it's magnetic, so it locates itself on a refrigerator, um, so you, your lighter is, is always where you need it when you need it. And uh, it had the, there was a kind of breakthrough moment in there where we discovered that putting the magnets uh, would also allow the cap to stick to the magnet instead of flying off into space. Um, simple pleasures. Um, this was, it was a simple product in some ways. Um, it's just a bottle opener. And um, what's different about it is, uh, is that it, it had a kind of intellectual um, kind of uh, program. I wanted to make something which was playful. I wanted to remind people that, uh, that opening a bottle of wine didn't have to be uh, a malicious act. I don't know, does anyone have the, um, the, the rabbit corkscrew opener here? It's OK if you do. Um, so it's, it's like having a machine gun to open your wine bottle with. And, uh, and I just think, uh, you know, while this doesn't take like a political position, it, 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 we as designers have to ask, does it always have to be better, stronger, faster? And it's an important question to ask. And we have a habit, especially in America, of always making it better, stronger, faster. Um, so the question is, you know, what, what's appropriate language for these things? And, and when you think about wine, uh, it's a ritual. It's something that, um, that is meant to be enjoyed slowly. And while we might not be so good at slow here, we're getting better. And so this, this was about kind of uh, that idea of simple pleasures. Um, considering the void, something that designers, I think, have a habit of doing is looking for design where it doesn't exist. Um, and so this uh, project had to do with that um, in some ways. This is a, uh, a bookend, which is actually, uh, it has less waste than its, its ancestors in the, um, in the production of, um, of folded metal bookends. What I did was created this clip uh, without adding any um, welded uh, pieces that, that holds in a, um, a piece of glass. And so it, it provides this opportunity for a, a picture frame at the, at the unusual um, side of a bookend um, or an area of books. This was actually a very strong seller with uh, Kickerland. And Pavlovian, Pavlovian tactics. So I, I quit smoking now uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, but when I did it, I noticed that uh, it was hard. 
and there were lots of uh, things out there which you know tried to help you and I found them incredibly inelegant all those things you know chewing gums and patches and programs and you know uh, so I thought you know is, is it possible <laughs> that the power of suggestion could help so I this was making a vessel that enabled your habit while subtly reminding you that uh, might not be the best thing in the world for you. And this was a huge seller, actually, <laughs> um, which was interesting. I, I don't know if it actually helped anyone. I, I'd like to think that it did. Um, play. Not to be underestimated um, what that can mean. And this is an interesting story because this was not meant to be a playful object. Uh, the salt and pepper shaker for Kickerland um, was uh, a salt and pepper shaker kind of in response to um, there you can see some images of it it's magnetic it sticks together but it was a, a response to um, salt and pepper shakers which I had you know dropped and broken because they were ceramic or glass um, so I started working with soft materials to come up with uh, a solution for this salt and pepper shaker and in, in the end this magnetic uh, project came out which sort of rolls around um, on the tabletop in a, in a very um, kind of indignant manner in, in your in your dinner conversation and uh, it, it was another really big uh, hit it was like the cover of the business section of the New York Times and uh, people just loved this thing they didn't love it for the same reasons that I loved it I, I loved it because it wouldn't break when it fell off the table and there's a, if you've read Don Norman's book on emotional design, it's the same kind of story of the, although not as big a seller, I guarantee, as the Philip Stark uh, juicer. Not necessarily a better um, salt and pepper shaker here, although it works. Um, it, it just resonated with people in a way that I didn't expect. And I think that's an interesting kind of um, story. What's that? Yeah? Could be. Yeah. Parasitic relationships. Um, this is uh, another one which is done very well, and I was actually this morning proudly showing all the knockoffs of it to my students um, that are out there. But this uh, was done um, shortly after Philippe Stark made a fly swatter that had a graphic uh, varying the whole patterns on, on the swatter part to show a face. Um, and so for me, this is a, it is a kind of acknowledgement of that and a kind of continuation of that conversation um, because when, we, when I designed this for Kickerland, the, uh, the strict utilitarianism of this thing wasn't quite enough. So we added the fly, and I thought that was kind of a nice tip of the hat. And what's interesting now is that there's a whole line of these fly swatters that people play with the whole patterns to make different shapes and different stories. So that I feel like this was sort of second in line of this long conversation, uh, which is interesting to see. Um, in any case, uh, it, it, it sells a lot, I think, because it, it does... Um, what it purports to do. It makes itself more accessible. That the, the, the hook on the end is scaled to fit around a doorknob, and there's a strong magnet in there, so this can always be available when you need it, which is the principal problem <laughs> in uh, fl fly swatters. They're not there when you need them. Same uh, attitude in the design of this door stopper for area wear, uh, which has also been a very good seller. Um, and I say, by the way, when things are good sellers, because I think there's, there's some value to understanding when something's a good seller in the marketplace, because the marketplace you know, pronounces judgment of many of these things. But that's not always the most important thing, which I'll talk about later. At any rate, a standard door stopper, which also acknowledges its environment by giving itself a place to rest so you don't trip over it. Creating efficiencies is something we do as designers, right? It's our bread and butter. Um, this is a, a project for Kickerlin, which uh, looked at all the different measures uh, that a bartender um, needs to have handy and uh, boils them into a single uh, cube. And so the, the cube facades are all evacuated in different um, ways to uh, accommodate. And it's based off of um, this notion that, that a cup or a device that pours could work as a cube. The old um, Japanese sake um, cups are cube shaped. This is a uh, Kickerlin, still manufactures that. Uh, affordance, this, uh, this was a project done for Design Philadelphia, which is a citywide uh, design event. And um, they, uh, DuPont Corian had asked a bunch of uh, architects and me um, <laughs> to do uh, benches 
for the city and to work with DuPont Corian and their material to realize these benches. They asked us to make Philadelphia benches. And to me, that meant um, looking at the uh, sitting culture in Philadelphia. And if anyone's been to Philly or Brooklyn or um, Baltimore, you'll know that uh, stoop culture is this kind of uh, bread and butter there. So people sit on their stoops. And, uh, and so this project ended up being uh, basically a stoop um, that uh, we made out of the material and then removed from its context. But the, the rationale for doing this is that it actually makes a more interactive bench. Because benches are, are linear, mostly. And so you have two or three or four people sitting in a bench, and the people on the end can't really talk to the other people very well. So this, this idea of creating other platforms enables more conversation. So it was a really interesting um, kind of piece to make. And then we cited it um, along the um, Schuylkill River in a kind of unusual place. And uh, uh, it was a pretty, pretty interesting project. Um, Power of Suggestion. Uh, this was a project done originally for a company called Bozart, but then relicensed to Kickerland. Um, and I, I was just sort of inspired by the um, um, bowling pin. And so spent some time trying to figure out how I could turn that innate condition that we're all aware of, that bowling pin tells two stories, one when it's standing up and one when it's down, into a, into a lamp. And uh, the reason I show this slide, because that's the image of the piece, you know, obviously standing up, lit, and then when you knock it over, it's off, um, is because uh, so much of what we do as designers is in the details. And for me, uh, it's, it's critically important, especially as someone who is a bit of a minimalist, that those details are, are just spot on all the time. Um, so, you know, the way the chord enters, um, you know, it's, was very, very important for me in this. You know, there's a lot of bad chords in the world. In fact, I, I had this conversation with Massimo Vignelli recently. We talked for about an hour about chords. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is that you know, th this is a product that might be for an adult, but it might also be for a child. And so um, there's nobody who told me that I had to make that um, the uh, connection system um, very, very difficult for a child to get into. We could have made it in a variety of ways. But for me, there's a kind of ethical um, motive there, a reason to make that a, a strong connection and one that prevents you know, a kid from getting hurt. So, um, so that was, you know, it's like a medicine bottle top there. And that, that, there was a lot of work that went into making that seamless and beautiful and also um, you know, good for kids. By the way, the, the images that I show are all um, photographs. A lot of times people are confused as to whether it's a rendering or not, but these are all photos of actual pieces. I don't, I don't show any renderings in this slideshow. Um, the the um, um, indigenous uh, population of Australia uses this uh, term, the um, walkabout. And uh, it's a kind of dream time, this, uh, this idea that there's a kind of collective unconscious that we tap into. And this project was a, um, a piggy bank. Uh, it was maybe the fastest thing I've ever designed that went to production. Um, it was uh, done for a company called uh, Bozart, uh, which is no more. But uh, they asked me to do something in ceramic because they had a good ceramic factory and they, they were a company that made things for adults and children alike. And so I thought, well, you don't have a piggy bank. That's a natural for ceramic and this cocktail napkin sketch. And then the thing came back from the factory a day later or whatever. And it was shocking how well received this thing was to me. And I, you know, retrospectively think that it was because it was such a quintessential kind of caricature of a pig. You know, it was finding the most cartoony kind of likeness. The nose is a, a strong detail. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, the shape was important because all the coins fall to the bottom easily to come out. Um, and that's since been knocked off a number of times. So there are other designs like it um, now that this is off the market. Uh, midlife crisis of objects uh, is something I, I sort of toy with a lot. And, um, thinking about that all objects have a lifespan. And, um, and for me, planning um, uh, for that lifespan is quite important. In, in some ways, you can think about um, you know, the, the heirloom quality that, that I talked about earlier. But this uses the details to think about the things that could go wrong. 
So this is actually made of MDF and, um, and it's painted, but those edges are all purposefully revealed because where things come together on those ugly brown um, edges, which are the color of the MDF, um, scuffs don't show. Uh, Mars don't show, damage doesn't show because of that color. And so those are kind of functional details that anticipate um, its, uh, its uh, age. And that was another strong seller with Beaux-Arts. Um, it was a kind of, uh, we, we did it flat, ready to assemble. So it packed into something like a pizza box with a handle and, and people would readily kind of walk out of shops buying a table, which is something you don't necessarily always do. Um, that company went under and that sort of intellectual property from that project got ported to a company that I had started working with in northern Italy called Casamania. And so we took that same design language and uh, based on their technology and, yeah, sorry, these are, it's the projector that blows out the images here, not the images. But, uh, but these are some um, details of, of those larger um, pieces for Casamania. That's a coat rack we did. Um, using the same methodology and language. Um, visual sampling, this idea that, um, that we pull from you know, popular culture and the world around us. Uh, like the CD um, jewel cases I showed earlier, you know, our, our currency is dematerializing. So what do you do in that kind of uh, pimply-faced um, period in between technologies? And so we were thinking about the coin bank and how it could be appropriated for this company, Cosmonia, and they liked the idea of kind of um, using uh, a storage space um, either in the home or the office to kind of clean up that mess. Excuse me. Um, these are just some shots of the rotational molding for this, uh, which is done in a factory in northern Italy. And, uh, there's a shot of it. Exploring parameters. Th this is really one of my favorite projects, actually. Um, and it's going to be hard to see because of the, the projector. But um, this is I, probably the highest volume of any piece that I've done in terms of manufacturing. But this, this I have a utility patent on. And it's uh, hard to see, obviously. It's like a ghost product right now. But, <laughs> um, but really what we're looking at is a, a report cover that has a, um, a patented clip on it. And the, the interesting thing about this, you, maybe you've never thought about it, but um, when, you, when you write a paper in college or in high school, um, you, uh, you might put it in a fancy plastic binder and then give it to your teacher to grade. Well, as teachers, the first thing we do is we take it out of that fancy plastic binder, we throw that thing in the recycling bin, we put a staple in it because we need to be able to fold it over and mark up the things that you've said um, and get it back to you. So this actually looks at that activity and, uh, and what it does is it provides a report cover that um, has a clip that pivots over the paper. So you can insert paper in there, fold the clip down, and then fold over the cover. Um, so it's a much more utilitarian um, uh, object. Okay. So um, just two case studies before we kind of um, get through it. One, uh, this was designed for Cosmonia. It's called the SOS stool. Um, now, I don't expect for you to you know, be able to read any of this stuff necessarily, but I, I want to take you through uh, a timeline on a project and, and you know, share with you uh, as an independent designer how, um, how I work together with a company. So this is what happens uh, as an independent designer. This is the company's role, and these are the, the places in which we intersect. This was a project that uh, was uh, given to me um, in April of 2007. Uh, the furniture industry um, often shows off new projects at the Salon del Mobile in Milan. Uh, it's kind of a, an amazing event. If you ever get a chance to go, you should go. Uh, the, the city of Milan's population doubles um, during that week. And architects, designers, everybody who's anybody. If you guys were in Europe, you'd be there. I guarantee it. Um, the student population, all the designers go every year and they camp out. It's, it's really an amazing um, event. In any case, um, so uh, the brief was to, to, um, to design a stool and um, 
So uh, I, I walked the, the furniture fair with the president of the company and um, their marketing and engineering folks. And, uh, and then I go home and come up with ideas, go back to pitch the project um, a few months later. And then uh, once I've gotten buy-in on the project, I begin to generate initial models. Uh, and we go back and forth with prototypes and engineering uh, revisions here. And then we begin a kind of story development, how to, how to explain what the project is, how it lives within the context of the company and the world. Um, and then tooling is here roughly around March. Uh, and then we present um, the project in April. Um, and then there's some other rollout details. But that just gives you a kind of general timeline. Um, now, the, you know, designing a, a in this case, a rotationally molded polyethylene stool. I had, I had a lot of constraints around um, making the project. The principal innovation uh, for me was uh, here in extending the, um, the surface of the top so that the typology blends between stool and, uh, and tray. And these are just some shots of um, kind of figuring out that, that principal kind of uh, uh, development. And these are um, just very quick sketches that show um, the concept. I think I used some of these to pitch the idea to Cosmonia. And these are just uh, images of the first uh, models that I, I'll make rather quickly. Um, and here, uh, as we're going to tooling, the, what they'll do, what they did in this factory is use a, a five axis router to mill out these um, uh, parts in styrofoam and then they can um, look at the flow patterns of the plastic and hear where the, where the seams are going to be in the mold. And that's the, the mold after we textured it here. And then I always get uh, very involved in the photography in order to try and tell the story of these things accurately. So these are the images that we picked to, to show off the project. These are some of the final pieces after they popped out of the mold. And this shows you just some of the functionality. Um, in that timeline, I showed some, um, some sort of post-production images, or sorry, post-production information. And this was a partnership with DWR to, um, to talk about the piece. Uh, as part of Design Philadelphia, I did a lecture to describe the process. And here we showed off all the developmental sketches and stuff in this. Um, platform, and, and these were some of the models. Um, so this is the release at the Salon de Mobile um, in Milan, these images here. And then the, uh, the Biennale, in, uh, which is the architecture Biennale in Venice, uh, bought a couple hundred of these stools, and so they sighted them around the naval shipyards. Um, and then not too long after it was released, it was inducted into the Pompidou's uh, permanent design collection in Paris. And that seemed to set off a chain of um, these museum acquisitions. And one thing I want to mention about the museum acquisitions, it's not, for me, it's not sort of like a patting yourself on the back kind of thing. It's, um, you know, as I said before, it's, sometimes it's the marketplace that pronounces judgment and tells you that you've made a good product. Um, but other times there, there are other things, like these museum acquisitions, for me, are a sort of acknowledgment of a job well done in a larger sense, in a cultural sense, that you've made sort of con some sort of contribution to the lineage of, of uh, design thought. Um, the, the 8125 calculator was a, another interesting story that I thought I would tell briefly. Um, this was designed for the oldest manufacturer of calculators in the US. They have the very first patent on the first adding machine. And uh, they called me out of the blue one day, because they're not far from Philly, and said, you know, we like what you do, and um, we're trying to figure out who we want to be when we grow up again. So we got together, and, and we talked about their company, and we looked at their history and their trajectory. And, um, and really, I sort of functioned as a, as a consultant for a number of years before we, um, we actually got into product design. In fact, I didn't think we'd ever design a product. I thought, if anything, we'd sort of dematerialize their products. But in the end, they wanted something like a, a concept car um, as a calculator. And we, um, we not only design, redesigned the calculator after, um, after looking at their, the opportunities, but we, um, we were trying to reinvigorate the brand and to rethink um, their future based on their, their history. So these are just some examples of some of the um, 
conceptual development. In the end, um, we were able to reduce the footprint of this, uh, this adding machine dramatically, reduce the parts count dramatically, um, and make it out of smarter uh, materials and with smarter technology. Um, in the end, it was, it was a bit shocking to know that, that uh, actually accountants use these things and they want these things, and there's a long story there um, that, that uh, creates an argument for, um, for having them. Um, but they, in, in the case of Monroe, they had, um, um, I don't know where that's coming from. It's not my slide. <laughs> We're getting like a feed of what's going on. Um, huh, maybe I should build that in. Yeah, we've been hacked, sorry. Uh, in any case, uh, let's see if I can shut it off. <laughs> okay. Um, in any case, it, the, the, the product um, did extremely well for them and boosted their sales uh, in a huge way. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, it's not a design-driven market, and they got so many compliments from their users on, uh, on this uh, refined version of, of their product because we had made these different improvements and changed the price point uh, and made it easier for people to use. And then I also redid the brand and they, they gave me um, carte blanche to, to redo their logo and all these things to reposition the product. Um, and then a designer's work is never done. Um, I went in and, and I couldn't stand the fact that this product that I had worked so hard on making better for users was going to be accompanied by a 200-page Microsoft Word document that was like reading, you know, like arthritic, you know, Chinese. I couldn't really see what's going on in that thing. So um, we redesigned the entire um, book, and uh, and so it's full of charts and graphs, which make it easier for a user to to understand the complexities of a complex machine like this. So. Um, Finally, bringing these things together in some sort of convergence and, and trying to understand how these different tools could be used um, to move ideas forward um, is, is, is you know, kind of what I do as an educator and a, and a practitioner um, to, to create these heirloom products. And I, and I recently, I think, have been doing the kind of work that I've been wanting to do all along. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to share a couple of examples of, of what I think are, are really good um, projects that really contribute in meaningful ways. Um, I did a big project with my students, and it, you know, if after the fact you're interested in the student work from RIT, if you just Google me or go to the um, RIT website, you can see all those projects, which are pretty exciting. Um, uh, we, we spent a whole, um, essentially a semester, um, working with uh, the Corning Museum of Glass, and they're an amazing resource. Uh, we, we had uh, 20 industrial designers and 20 uh, glass students collaborate to deliver ideas that we showed at the uh, International Contemporary Furniture Fair in New York. And um, we had so much fun working with those folks at, uh, at Corning that afterwards they invited me to come down and do something which they call a uh, glass lab, uh, which is basically they give an architect or a designer um, a couple of master craftsmen to work with uh, in their live uh, glass area. And, um, and to realize ideas that you bring to the table. Uh, these are just impossible to see, I guess, because it's sort of white on white. Um, well, we'll do our best. At any rate, um, the, this is a, it's a glass cup that has these uh, facets that accept a, um, a uh, toothbrush. Um, and this is a, uh, a bedside bowl, which has a very specific slot in it that accepts uh, uh, cord, but keeps the cord from falling off the table, which is, we've all had that experience. Um, so this charges your, your cell phone. Um, and this is <laughs> a total ghost. But at any rate, um, what's interesting here is it's, it's uh, rethinking um, how, you, how you access toilet paper. And I, I don't know if any of you have bought um, the toilet paper rolls, which are tubeless. Um, do you know about these? They have no cardboard tube in them. Well, if you haven't seen these, they're pretty remarkable. Um, and if you do the math and you look behind the scenes at 
um, how many uh, hectares of rainforest we're, <laughs> we're uh, saving by not having those little cardboard tubes in there. It's shocking. Um, so you're sort of saving the world one toilet paper tube at a time. I've always, since they came out, I've been fascinated by that development. What's interesting about those toilet paper rolls is they don't work very well uh, in the conventional um, dispensers that we have because there's no solid tube in the inside. But what I noticed is that you could just pull the toilet paper from the center and it works remarkably well, but nobody markets that. It's, it simply hasn't been <laughs> um, utilized. So go out there and make more product designs um, around that because uh, it will make things better for us. In any case, what this is, is it, it's a glass uh, kind of container that just organizes the toilet paper and protects it from a moisture driven environment and uh, you can easily pull the toilet paper out the top. Um, and I'm actually commercializing this with Corning right now. Um, they've not been a manufacturer of products um, like this, but we're, we're actually working on bringing it to market. We, we may have it ready for ICFF in May. Um, and these are products that I've been doing um, for a company called Contexter. Um, this is called the Hanging Line. And these, the idea here is that um, we could use uh, these silicon rubber bands to, um, um, to hang things in the bathroom. And so this is basically um, these rubber caps and hanging items. And this is a, uh, a silicon band that's all one piece of molded material. Um, these hooks come along with it and they provide a series of opportunities um, in the bathroom. And these mirrors are, they just came back from the factory. I've got them sitting in my studio right now. Uh, everything has got this kind of proprietary connection system, which allows you to locate uh, the mirror or the, uh, the hanging device very easily. And if anyone's ever installed uh, a mirror, a hanging mirror, you'll know that it's sometimes a guessing game of precise placement because you can't see the way the hanging hardware works. Well, this makes it very, very easy. And so uh, this one is a, a regular mirror, and this one's a, a magnifying mirror, and they kind of work in tandem. And what's really nice about this product is that uh, because it's silicon, you can get away with all sorts of tricks uh, in the tooling. The silicon, uh, you can do all sorts of interesting overmolding, and uh, you can pop the silicon out of molds where a, 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 a rigid plastic piece couldn't. So um, there are all kinds of interesting tricks. It's basically a one-piece design. Pops out of the mold, and then you, you slide the glass in there and snap it into place. And this is a tissue box holder um, in the same line. So everything here is made of uh, silicon. The WC line also looks at um, unpopular problems in the bathroom. Um, and, uh, and these are, um, again, all uh, silicon. There are no parts to go wrong. Um, you, the only thing that um, you could change would be this um, wooden piece which threads in much the way a broom handle does. Um, so this can be replaced. The interesting thing about silicon is it's incredibly durable. It's washable and uh, you know, th these could last forever, essentially. Um, and you know, like the fly swatter and the door stopper that I showed before, um, the problem with these objects is nobody wants to really live with them um, and everybody wants to hide them away. And if you're hiding something like this away when you really need it, getting to it is, a, is an issue. So, um, so anyway, these, these have been um, very well received even though they're, they're just recently released to the marketplace. So, um, thank you. Um, that's, that's the convergence at the end there that I wanted to share. And, um, Questions? Question. And um, uh, since we are recording this, uh, we need to get the questions uh, through the microphone. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please hold up your hand. Josh, you talked a lot about the idea of simplicity. Yeah.
Sure, there, there's uh, uh, another lecture, many actually other lectures about that. Um, it, it, it's challenging, I think, to, to be in a context like this and to show ideas which, um, which do look simple. Um, but, but what I try to convey is that there are all these layers of meaning and materiality and so on that, are, that lead to um, you know, these conclusions that seem like aha moments, right? You see, it, we all know when we see products that are important or useful that uh, in their best case scenarios, um, you think, well, why didn't I think of that? It's so, it's so simple. But it's always a process of, of um, you know, intense research and form development and material exploration. Um, I tried to get a little bit into it with the case studies to show that there's more than just a, a pretty face at the end of these things. But uh, yeah, I mean, I can't underline um, enough how uh, valuable the process is and how um, immensely complex it is um, to make all those um, decisions. Um, there's, a, there's a great essay. Has anyone ever read anything by Noto Fukasawa? You guys? Anybody? No? Um, it's a great book to get, Japanese designer, Japanese product designer, whose work I bet you've seen somewhere on a blog or whatever, and you've probably thought that's awesome. Um, but uh, he, he published a book a couple years ago, and there's a, a little essay in there called The 0.5 Millimeter Radius. And it's a very kind of Eastern position to take, uh, to, to think so carefully about something like that. But it's, it's a vitally important conversation. He talks about why a 0.5 millimeter radius feels good in your hand and why a 0.5 millimeter radius, it could be the conclusion of lots and lots of you know, studies on, on how to make something feel good. It's about human scale and it's about kind of refining down things which are somehow quintessential. And I think that's a you know that that's one good example of just how um, how much testing one has to do to to get to something um, of that of that sort of clarity achieving that kind of clarity. Um, but yeah, it's I mean you know it's uh, it's a it's always a long process of trying to uh, trying to achieve that end goal, which in the end seems uh, almost as if it exists without thought. Do you recall the name of the book? That he uh, it's self-titled. I think it's called Naoto Fukasawa. Is that the one you're? It's N A O T O. Naoto is the first name. Last name is F U K A S A W A. Um, and I, I Tashin or Rizzoli. I'm not sure of the publisher, but I'm sure if you Google it, it'll come right up. It's a very, very interesting book. Um, I can also repeat the question if right. somebody. Uh, they're they're going to they're going to edit all this so that <laughs> you're going to edit it so that we will not see any technical glitches. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'll tell them it was perfect. I noticed that uh, your projects are really well documented, and that's one of the things we'll talk about when mm. we get back to class. But I also note that you develop a narrative. Could you talk a, a little bit about? how that is wound up in your process from start to finish and the importance of that narrative when you are explaining to client your reasoning and what that whole process is to help clients understand what your thinking is, especially when in a situation like yours where your work is so minimal and so clean and again, apparently simple. Hmm. Well, um, you know, I think it's, it's vitally important to, to be able to communicate your work in a, in a consistent way. And um, it's hard to document process. Um, you know, you, you sort of want, especially in this day and age where everything is documented and everybody is, you know, blogging about everything all the time, um, it, it's, it's also interesting to note that, that it's not really all that well organized. It's sort of ephemeral. Um, but, you know, I tell my students, you know, document everything. You never know when it'll be useful. There are so many um, 
blind alleys that we go down as designers to investigate things. And to have that research palpable um, at all times can be really critical. I, I, I am often sort of unpopular uh, with my students in that I make them, you know, coat the walls with their um, research, um, you know, drawings and um, uh, reference material, you know. It, they, they'll say, well, it takes up a lot of space and it takes up more time, I can keep it digitally. But, um, but I think that there's something to be said for having everything visible to you at once. Um, and, and documenting that, that process and, and regurgitating it you know, allows you to make connections that you might not otherwise take. So um, process, documenting process is hard, but it's, it's really worthwhile. And, and it, you know, it's amazingly useful when you're, when you're looking for work, right? You, you have to be able to, that's what employers want to see. They want to um, see the evidence of process. They want to see how you think. So it's, it's it's everything for, for us, as, especially as young designers. Um, developing a narrative is, is about um, describing your personality or, or, or sharing who you are through your work in some ways. And um, you know, for me, uh, you know, it's, it's a little, uh, you know, I, I exist in this funny place between academia and practice. And um, so in some ways, I have the luxury of picking and choosing the companies that I work for. And so, you know, people have said, well, your work looks, you know, the same no matter who your client is. And that's because I've been fortunate enough to um, work with clients that want to work with me. Um, and, and because I have a life as an academic, I might turn away a project that I think is going to lead to something that falls outside of my range of work uh, and would push me into something that, an area that I don't want to go into, for example. So, um, so the narrative ends up being very much, um, you know, uh, a story of the kind of project that I, I think is the right kind of project to do. Um, but I think that, um, just to sort of speak to your, I think your question is, is um, you know, I think it's vitally important to develop that kind of um, uh, way of communicating work and, uh, and um, you know, using these tools of kind of capturing process and, uh, and um, you know, using photography to, to document end product as well is, is you know, sort of everything. Especially in this world, <laughs> we make, you know, as designers, we make 3D things, and yet most of the way we communicate is, is in flat form. So the, the photographs have to be really rich and, and, uh, and tell stories well. Does that, does that get to your question? Or? Mm. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that 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 uh, in my experience, they're they're very open. Um, clients are very open to hearing your perspective and and your um, your story because it's only going to strengthen the way the product is uh, is delivered. So. Um, so I, I, I get involved whenever I can in, in helping them to clarify and to tell those stories. Just a question in the back here, and, and it's just the camera, so you can move a little bit that way, so you don't want that right across the face. Okay. <laughs> and that's what we don't want the advertising. <laughs> De facto brand. The spy design. Um, hi, Josh. I have a question regarding um, uh, human stories, and you had mentioned that in your childhood um, you had uh, gone to the archaeological sites and it was important to you uh, to find out um, all those interesting and mysterious human stories. And I wonder if you could comment on uh, what human story, or is there a most profound human story to you um, that propels you? In your design work. That's a, a very interesting question. Good question. Um, I don't know that there is a single sort of story that comes to mind, but I, you know, I think a lot of what what I try to do is to is to create things which are universal, which is a kind of um, impossible goal. Uh, we talk about universal design, and, and the hope is that you know you can make a chair that fits everybody, but the reality is it's it's impossible to do that. Um, and I, I guess in some ways I, I seek to, um, to make products which endure 
and products that are, um, are useful to many, um, if not to everyone. Um, so there, that in itself is a kind of human story that, that I try to access, try to make things which are meaningful and enduring. And, and that, it's, a, it's a constant uphill battle because we're, we are always evolving technologically and materially and so on. Um, so I think, it, for me, it's the most, that's the most challenging, you know, human story that, that, that I'm trying to grapple with. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think design, well, communication is at the heart of all these things, right? So, uh, and it's, you know, a, a sort of a clear modernist tenant to think about, um, you know, organizing information and, and clarifying use and so on. And so I think that there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and um, for sure, uh, the, the idea that the object communicates its function uh, is central. Yeah, that's true. Okay, or maybe one final question. You get you get the last word tonight. This is good I'm stuff. Not even sure what my question is. <laughs> <laughs> we can just talk if you want. You're kind of this this expert, and I this I really love the the pair of functionality and the this the innate gesture that you 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 seem to accomplish. Is that I'm just wondering where is that based off of your own sort of experience, or where do you sort of where do you find the um, is this just through personal observation? that happens, you know, in the studio or, you know, is it outside the studio? Um, it, when you say sense? gesture, you mean the, the, the Sort of the, the combining of the funk, the striking of the match on this, on the uh, cast iron. Oh, sure. Right. Well, uh, yeah, it happens sometimes, I guess, in the studio. Um, yeah, we're looking at, um, you know, the, the research that leads to the end product is, is always um, kind of uh, getting your hands on uh, whatever product it is that you're trying to understand or, um, you know, mining the situation that you're trying to um, investigate opportunities in. Um, for me, it's always very experiential, you know, and um, you know, in the case of the menorah, we were, you know, lighting those things and trying, um, and, but also thinking about the ritual and the history behind it. And, you know, that was a very interesting kind of project to look at. Um, so it's, it's always through testing, it's always through observation, it's always through looking at the marketplace. Um, you know, I regularly, when I start a project, one of the first things I do is, if the project is, is you know, looking at a specific object, like the stool, for example, one of the first things I do is I look at the history of stools, <laughs> you know, and, and so in, in that case, we have this huge kind of lookbook of, uh, you know, shaker stools and African stools and, you know, looking at every culture that we can get our hands on and, and why um, something was developed uh, within the, the set of constraints and the rationales and the cultural um, baggage that, that, that led to answering a question in a certain way. And, and in looking at those and laying those things out um, in, in as broad a kind of way as possible, um, we could start to see um, what opportunities there were and, and what, uh, if any, universal needs there might be in, in today's world. Um, so in that case, you know, there was a lot of, of that kind of research that was done. And then once the broad net is thrown out and you see what's, what's been done, there's always a question of, well, what's relevant now? What do people do now? And so it's this kind of exhaustive looking at, at everything that, that's peripheral to that you know, opportunity, and then, of course, boiling in all the technological constraints and the material, and, you know, in that case, we had to think about how many we could get into, you know, get how many boxes we can get onto a pallet, and all, you know, it's just huge kind of set of things that you have to juggle, that you have to boil down into, you know, what, what, what is the opportunity 
And then once you get there, it's this kind of, you know, like you saw, this kind of iterative study of actual forms and actual materials and, you know, how is it going to fit? How is it going to contextualize? So it's just a, <coughs> it's a huge process. And uh, in the end, it sort of ends up, right, looking simple. But um, it's not. <laughs> yeah. I think um, it might have been Edison that said, uh, you know, uh, invention is sort of 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. But I think you bring another component to this, and that is contemplation. So um, there's, a, there's a whole, especially in the, in the world that we, that we live in today where we can sort of Google anything and there's all sorts of incoming inputs, it's all inputs, the, the notion of being able to contemplate something and sort out what down to simple, I think is really, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. I think everyone's grateful that you're here. So thank you very, very much. Thank for you. Sharing your. Thank you.